Is my screen visible? Okay, I can see it. Yep, okay. All right, so it's 4 p.m. I think uh, we can get started. Is, is my voice audible? Hello, is my audio audible? Yes, audible. All right, thank you. OK, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody for the session on hacking and securing Docker containers. I'm sorry, there is some uh, background noise from someone. Please, uh, uh, everybody, please unmute. OK, so my name is Srinivas. Uh, I, I live in Singapore. I worked with Condition Zebra in the past, and uh, I'm a good friend of Condition Zebra, and uh, they invited me for this guest lecture. Um, so, so basically, this talk is going to cover a few different things. We will begin by understanding the need for Docker, and we will understand some fundamentals of Docker. And followed by that, uh, we will see some hacking techniques on how Docker containers can be misconfigured and how attackers can abuse them to gain uh, un un unintended, unintended, unintended access to those containers. And then we will finally see a simple demo of how we can run some automated security audits to protect the Docker containers. Okay, so after that, we will uh, at the end we will have a quick uh, Q&A session. So if you have any questions, you can probably post them in the chat. So with that, let's get started with the basics of Docker. So if you do a quick Google search of what is Docker. You will you will get this result. It says Docker is a software that performs operating system level virtualization. So that that is also known as containerization. So if you are from virtual machines background, you do virtualization for the hardware. When it comes to containers, it is for virtualization. It is it is for virtualizing the operating system, right? So that's uh, so that's basically what a containerization is. We will get into uh, some more details about Docker in a moment, but for now let's just uh, remember that Docker is a software that performs operating system operating system level virtualization for us. OK, so why do we need Docker? Now this is the first question. OK, I have Windows machines, I have Linux machines, and I have my virtual machines. Now why is what is the need for this new software called Docker? Now. If you take a simple example, if you are a developer, let's assume that you have developed a software on computer one. Now let's take probably a Ruby on Rails app application as an example. Now you have developed it and you want your friend to test it on his computer. Now when you transfer this software, he has to make sure that the second computer also has all the dependencies that are required to run the first app, the, that are required to run the application that was successfully working on our computer one. So to avoid this problem, now, now if the second computer is missing any dependency, the application probably will not work there. So to avoid this problem, we we can use docker so so docker can a docker image will have all the dependencies that your application requires and the second user just needs docker software to be installed on his device and he can just simply run your application without having to worry about any dependencies so that's uh, that's the reason why we can use docker now the next one is the differences between virtual machines and containers now it is a very common question uh, when we talk about containers a lot of people get confused how is it different from a traditional virtual machine that we have been using now let me quickly uh, give a brief introduction to the differences between the virtual machines and containers now let's assume that this is your hardware and typically when you talk about virtual machines you have two options 
one install and host operating system and then install an hypervisor on top of it and then runs uh, and then run some virtual machines Let, let's say this is a windows 10 virtual machine let's say this is a, a linux uh, probably a ubuntu virtual machine and let's say this is a centos virtual machine now in this case you are having a complete guest operating system on your hardware right so the other option is probably to have a hypervisor directly on the hardware and then have a couple of virtual machines on top of it without having a separate host operating system even in that case you're having uh, guest operating systems in each virtual machine now that's a typical uh, virtual machine setup now when it comes to containers you will have the hardware and on top of it you will have the host operating system and on top of it you will have multiple containers running and if you notice these containers there is no special guest operating system in it they can basically make use of your host operating systems linux kernel and they can simply uh, run it by virtualizing this linux kernel so that's the basic difference you don't need to have a guest os uh, separately for running each container so that 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 removes a lot of uh, uh, heavy lifting uh, from your virtual so, so that is uh, basically what is going to cause a lot of heavy lift uh, how to put it so because of uh, because of special operating because of the guest operating system that you're having on the virtual machine this becomes very heavy especially uh, in terms of size but if you take a look at the containers you are completely removing having a special operating system having a separate operating system even in this case this container can be uh, this can be this container can be used to simulate a centos and this container can be used to sim uh, simulate uh, ubuntu virtual machine and, and, and things like that so basically even if you are not having a separate operating system you can still have similar uh, functionality within the container now another uh, difference now i have been talking about docker image container and all that now people always get confused about these things especially if they don't have hands on experience with them so the difference between image and container if you are from programming background you might know about classes and objects probably you can think image as a class and container as an object so if you have one class you can create multiple objects from that right similarly if you have one image you can create multiple containers from that single image i'm going to show you a quick demo of that but before that let's take a pictorial representation of it so let's assume that this is a ubuntu image a docker image that you have and using this image you can basically spin up any number of containers that you want so each of these container is a separate instance so especially if you are running uh, production workloads you may want to have multiple replicas of your of your applications that you're running now in such cases uh, this is this is pretty useful you can create an image of your application and you can start multiple instances as containers and this is what typically is being done in uh, places like kubernetes right so uh, so, so with this, this is the basic difference between image and container. Image is something like a class. It, it contains all the dependencies and everything. And once you want to run the application, then you need to spin up a container using the image. Right. So I'm going to quickly show you a demo of this. Uh, this, uh, this session is going to have a lot of demos. We are going to see pretty much everything as a practical demo. Um, not sure why I am not able to. OK, so. I hope everybody is able to see my Ubuntu VM, right? Can you please just say yes, someone, if you can see it? Yes. Sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah. All right, yep. Uh, okay, please go on mute now. Thank you for letting me know. Now, if you just just to save time in this uh, today's session, since we only have one hour, I have written everything uh, into a file. Basically, I, I wrote all the commands. So I don't have to type anything. Now I'm just going to quickly show you some uh, a quick demo of images and containers. 
uh, I'm going to uh, we are going to share this. We are going to share this list of comments after the session. Um, so for now, just uh, focus on the demos. So the first thing that I want to show is uh, a simple thing. How you can spin up a container. Now, first thing I want to uh, have an image to spin up a container. As I have mentioned earlier, we need to have an image. So we need to pull an image from somewhere. So what is that somewhere? That somewhere is basically called a registry. In this case, I am pulling an image from a registry called Docker Hub. So Docker Hub is something like like our Apple App Store or Google Play Store, where you can find a bunch of Docker images. Anyone can put an image there. So I have just uh, pulled an image from Docker registry, which is Docker Hub, and the image name is called Alpine. So I am using a Docker client, which is already installed on my laptop, and I have used the command pull, and I have pulled an image called Alpine. Alpine is basically a Linux uh, image. Uh, it is a very light. It is very lightweight, so that's why I'm using Alpine. OK, so now we have an image. We can actually uh, now start a container from this image. So let me just uh, run another command. So if you see this, I have started a con container now Docker is the client I'm using once again, and I'm using the command run dash itd is to specify that I'm I'm I want to start this container in interactive mode and in a daemon mode. So the container will be running in the background and I can interact with it. And I'm also giving it a name so that it is easy for me to identify what this container is. And uh, when I it is also going to be very easy for me when I want to interact with it. So let's quickly see how we can interact with this container now. So we can simply run docker exec dash it and we can simply specify the name of the container. In this case, we gave it the name container one. And finally, what command we want to run. I want to get a shell. So I'm just typing sh. sh is the shell, shell that I'm going to get now. As you can see, I'm now inside the container. So that's uh, basically how you can spin up a container from an image. So if you see this, I'm running this command once again, and this time I'm using the same Alpine image, but this time I'm giving it a different name so that I should be having another container instance. Now let's quickly see how many instances we have running on this machine. So if you see, I have run Docker space to list to see the list of Docker content containers that are running. And if you see, there are two containers, container one and container two, about a minute ago and five seconds ago. So this is a quick demo of how we can use Docker images to spin up multiple containers. Now let me quickly switch back to the switch back to my slides. Okay, so now we have seen how uh, we have just seen how we can pull the images and we have seen how we can spin up a container right now this is how this is what happens in the background i have just used a client and i have run docker space pull now in the background so the client is basically the docker command command line client i have used as as you have seen there is a software i have used that is called docker command line client and when i ran docker pull it basically talks to something called Docker daemon that runs on my system. So if you go back to the image here, you can see there is a Docker engine running here. So by my Docker client, which is running on this host OS, talks to this. And once after that is done, this Docker daemon basically checks if the image that I want is already present on my system. If it is present, it doesn't need to pull. So it, it, it saves some uh, time for us and resources for us. Now, if the image is not present, it is going to pull it from the Docker registry, right? So if the image is already present with the exact uh, uh, same details that we, that we requested for, basically it is not going to pull it from the registry. It is going to keep it, it is going to just uh, leave it as is. Now. After that, we ran Docker run to spin up a container. Now, what this will do is it will go ahead and talk to the Docker daemon and Docker daemon will now check if that image is present. If the image is present, it, will going, it is going to start a container for us. If the image is not present, it is 
in the in the background it is going to run docker pull for us and it is going to pull it from the registry and it is going to start a container after that so that's what is going to happen in the background when we were uh, running these commands so that's how docker uh, that's how we can use docker images to spin up containers now let's uh, talk about an important feature called c groups and namespaces so these are two important features that we should know about before we actually become hackers to hack into docker containers right so the first one is c groups c groups is a linux kernel feature that allows us to limit the access the processors and containers have to system resources such as cpu ram iops and network now I, I'm sure some, some of you might be wondering why is this guy reading the slide? It is important. Now, let me explain what the first sentence says. When you have a container, you are actually making use of the host system's Linux kernel. Now, from within the container, if an attacker basically gets access to the container, he can actually do something like uh, initiating a fork bomb and consume all the CPU resources from your host machine. So to prevent that, we can basically use this feature called C groups. So similarly, just not just the CPU resources, we can uh, put resources, we can put constraints on other uh, system resources like RAM, IOPS, network, and stuff like that. So that's basically C groups. Now I know it is going to be boring if we talk talk theory. Now let me quickly show you an example of how C groups can uh, help us enforcing these limits on the containers. Once again, I am switching to the virtual machine. And let me pull my commands just to save time. So first, we have already started a container. So let's probably, uh, okay, let's probably delete these containers first. Using Docker stop, Docker ps dash aq. So it will. So this command is going to give us the available container IDs, and after fetching those container IDs, this command is going to stop those containers. So basically, whatever the containers that are running on this machine will be stopped. And once that is done, we can also remove them. I always like to have uh, fresh system on my uh, fresh installation of containers for every demo instead of using the existing ones so that you will get a better understanding of what I'm doing here. So now once again, I'm starting a new container and look at this. It has produced an entry for us on the system. Now this is this entry is going to be associated with the container that we have just started. So what I'll do is I will just uh, find out the C group entries for this particular container. To do that, all we have to do is just uh, run this. So basically we are searching for this particular folder name. So this is basically a folder. There is a folder that's going to be created within this directory with this name. So I'm just searching for it. As you can see, we found that there are but there are multiple uh, folders with this particular identifier so this container has all these folders on this machine now what we are interested in is the pids i want to see how many new processes can be created on this container so if you go ahead and navigate to this directory and if you look at this file cat pids.max look at that by default you can have maximum number of pids on this container so that means you can basically create a simple fork bomb and you can uh, consume all the system resources now what i want to do is i want to set up a restriction on this particular container i will also show you how that is going to uh, look like after uh, creating that. So what I'll do is I will just create a new container now 
And if you look at this, I am setting a PID limit of six on this container. So what it means is after creating the container, even if this container is compromised, the maximum number of processes that can be created on this container is six. So I am creating a new container. Now let me just quickly show you the previous one. So to see the PIDs.max file, let's go to this folder and cat PIDs.max. Look at this. This has an entry of six in this case. Now let's quickly get a shell. So the container name is PID container. So let me quickly get a shell on this PID container. OK, we have got an shell. Now let me open up another terminal also so that we can see the stat statistics of what's going on inside the container. So I'm going to run Docker stats here. And let me just increase the font size a bit. OK, so if you see this, the since we have got in the shell, currently it has two PIDs on it. Now let me just uh, run this command. So what I'm going to do is I'm I'm basically creating one, two, three, four, five more, four more, and then. Uh, if you see, there is no problem. We are able to create it and look at this. The PID is went to six and it came back to two because the command is complete. Let me just do it once again so that you can see it. Notice uh, the six here because we are only running, we are only within the limit. Now let's add one more sleep command here and see what happens. Look at that. It says resource temporarily unavailable. You can't have more than six PIDs on this container. So that's how we can enforce resource constra constraints on the containers using C groups. So C groups is uh, one of the key features for Docker containers. Similarly, we have namespaces. So I'm, I'm not going to show a demo of namespaces because we want to have uh, more demos on the attacks. So namespaces uh, are basically to provide isolation to the containers from the host. For instance, let's assume that a root user on the host machine has created a file. And if you mount it onto the container, the, uh, the, the container should not have right access to that particular uh, file that is created by the root user on the host. So that can be achieved by using namespaces. So it can basically provide process isolation. Uh, it can provide uh, user ID namespace for privilege isolation and stuff like that. So, so just uh, remember that namespaces are for providing isolation to the containers from the host. So they will act as two different things. Now, the next one is hacking Docker containers. Now, this is what is this is where we are. It is going to get interesting. We want to see some interesting demos of what kind of attacks are possible on Docker containers and how attackers can abuse them if they are misconfigured. Now, there are three possible things that I'm going to talk about here. One is an external attacker. Now, let's assume that you have sp you spun up a container and there is a application running inside, and if the application has any security issues in that. In, in, in that, probably uh, someone somebody can uh, exploit that application using the vulnerabilities present in the application, and they can probably get initial foothold on your container. So that's that's a common uh, thing. I mean, it's not it's not anyway specific to Docker, but in general, external attackers can find some security issues that are exposed externally, and then they can probably get initial foothold on the container, and that's where the remaining things will start. For example, compromised container. Now, an external attacker landed on a container. What can he do? So there are there are a few things that he that that he can do. For instance, he can break out of the container. He can escape from it, and he can get uh, foot. He can get access to the host 
where the container is running now if you get access to the host basically you will have full, full control on uh, all the containers that are running on the host so that the, we don't want that so that's another thing that is possible with compromised containers now when it comes to malicious insiders that's the first demo that we are going to see now if you have an administrator who is part of docker group he is basically a root user on the system he can do anything on the system. So that's malicious insider. Now, let me just quickly show you some uh, examples of all the all these three categories of attacks. Let's begin with an external attacker uh, based uh, attack. So that is uh, possible if we are running vulnerable images. Now, let's assume that we wanted to build a web application on a Ubuntu based uh, Docker image. Now, some, now typically what we do is instead of building the image from scratch, we may want to take some base image from the Docker registry or somewhere and then we want to build the application on top of it. Now, if the image that we have pulled has any vulnerabilities, it is possible that they can be exploited. Now, I'm going to show you a quick demo of Shellshock uh, and how that can be exploited. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because Shellshock is not specific to Docker, but I just wanted to show you a demo of how Docker images, which are vulnerable by default, which are, I mean, when you pull vulnerable images from a place like Docker Hub, how they can be abused. So I'm what I'm quickly going to do is I'm quickly uh, going to spin up a con spin up a container from an image that I have pulled from Docker Hub, and that image is deliberately made vulnerable. So before we do, do that, let me just uh, once again stop the containers that I have. So that we can spin up a fresh container. This is the only command that is going to take more time than anything else in this session. So if we can complete complete running this docker stop command we are pretty much good to go okay so now let's begin by spinning up a new container so what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, start a new container for which is vulnerable to shell shock okay it's here now i'm just going to pull this in my case it's already pulled if it is not pulled already, it is going to start a new, it is going to do a new pull and it is going to pull it from uh, Docker Hub. So as you can see, the image name itself is vulnerables slash CV 2014 This is basically associated with Shellshock. So the image that I'm going to spin up is vulnerable to Shellshock. And if you look at this command, this, this particular image is going to expose a port this particular container is going to expose a port 80 and we are in turn mapping that port onto port 8080 on this particular host. So essentially what it means is we can access this application using this port 8080. Now let's now let's set up the background for our attack. So there is an application that is running inside this image and this image is vulnerable to shell shock and the application can be accessed using port 8080 basically the ip address of this host machine and 8080 so anybody can uh, access that let me quickly show you how we can do that and let me also just quickly clear the screen here okay so 172 dot 17 dot 0 dot 1 is the IP address of my machine and I'm accessing something on port 8080 as you can see the application is up and running now as an attacker what I want to do is I want to simply run an exploit that uh, fetches the HC password file from the server if you look at this we are trying to access localhost 8080 basically the application that is running on this port 8080 now let me just uh, hit enter and look at that we are able to read etc password uh, slash etc slash password file from this particular container now this is how somebody can basically exploit a shell shock 
or a vulnerable image that is downloaded now getting hc password file probably is not so interesting for us now let's get a reverse shell so i'm going to start a new con new terminal and i'm quickly going to start a netcat listener on port 4444 and now so basically this is a shell this is a attacker controlled shell and this is also attacker controlled machine and this is the victim's machine i'm doing everything on the same machine just to uh, you know avoid having multiple machines but this can be replicated using multiple machines now let's get uh, the reverse reverse shell command so what i'm going to do is i will quickly copy this and let me show you the listener as well as this so this is the listener now let me just run this here and look back look at that we got a reverse shell on the listener so this time we just ran a payload which gives us reverse shell instead of the contents of hc password that's it so that's the only difference now let's assume that you are an attacker and you got a shell okay now i'll stop the demo here now so the bottom line of this demo is that uh, a, a vulnerable application or an application is built on a vulnerable image and an attacker is able to gain access to that because a vulnerable image is used now let me go back to the slides and let's talk about the next topic that is i mean again this is related to the previous demo we will go back to the shell once again after this slide so now we are let's assume that an attacker has exploited a remote code execution vulnerability we have already done that now we got a shell in in a in a regular uh, security assessment or a penetration test when we get a shell we want to know where we landed is it a host machine is it a linux box is it a windows box is it a container or where did we land now to check if we are inside a docker container we can look for some docker specific artifacts so that's what i'm going to do now we can actually check for the contents of cat slash proc slash self slash c group so when we do this if it shows any entries that are having the word docker most likely we have landed on a docker container right so this is where the other attacks will start now if you go back to the uh, slides look at this if you go back to this slide uh, we mentioned that once an external attacker gets initial foothold on the container the other attacks will start like escaping from the container and uh, like gaining access to the host machine on which the containers are running now we are going to see uh, one or two demos of container escape techniques uh, but before that let me show you another one privilege escalation using volume mounts now let's assume that you are an administrator and you can and you are part of docker group you are not root user but you are part of docker group now let me show you what you can actually do on the machine so i'm just uh, exiting once again i'm going to quickly stop all these containers if too many containers are running it will be very hard for us to you know determine which container we want to interact with for the demo so that's the reason why i want to stop uh, all the containers that we don't need so i'm just removing this okay that's fine now what we want to do is we want to uh, check what kind of privileges we have let's first check if i can read slash hc slash shadow file if you are from linux background you probably know that hc shadow file contains the passwords of the users and only root users can read this now let's check the privileges i mean let's check let me check my output of id command and if you see i am not a root user i am part of dev group i am i am uh, i am the user dev and part of dev group but there is one interesting thing i am part of docker group now this is going to be very interesting attack especially if you are 
testing a CI CD pipeline where Jenkins will be able to run Docker commands without sudo. How do you do that? Usually, uh, what people do is in CI CD pipelines, uh, Docker privileges, uh, uh, I mean, Jenkins will be given Docker group. So, Jenkins will be made part of Docker group so that Jenkins can actually execute Docker commands. Now, if Jenkins is compromised, people think that it is not root, but if it is part of Docker group, it is root. So let me show you how how that is done. So if you if you if you got uh, access to a Jenkins machine which is part of Jenkins user which is part of Docker group, you can actually elevate your privileges very easily and you can uh, get root access on the host. So let me go back to the commands. Okay. So first. I do have a couple of files that are required for this demo. So let me just navigate to a folder called Docker to root. Before I show this demo, I took this demo from a blog titled this root your, root your Docker host in 10 seconds by electric mog. So full credits go to him. Now let's go back. OK, so within this we have four different files. We basically need only three files root shell.c, root.sh and docker file. If you look at this docker file, it is pretty simple. It basically pulls alpine image from the internet from the docker hub and it copies the file root.sh which is here into the container and it copies the file root shell which is this into the container. That's it. That's it's pretty doc it pretty simple docker uh, Docker file. So in case if you are new to Docker, Docker file can be used to create Docker images. Like we have uh, pulled a Docker image from Docker Hub, we can also create Docker images ourselves and that is what we are going to do now. So this is the content of Docker file. I'm going to create a new Docker image using these contents. So once again, uh, instead of typing things, I'm going to copy it just to save time. Now what would, what it will do is it will create a new docker file called uh, docker image called privesc and it is basically use, going to use the docker file within this current directory so if you see this it has built the image for us and it has tagged it as privesc latest so now what i want to do is i want to simply run this particular command i'll explain what it is going to do and if you look at this, it, it doesn't show any output. It basically uh, what it did is there is a folder called slash temp slash slash shared on my host machine on which I'm running these commands. And I mounted that path onto the container using another directory on the container. It can be anything. And after that, I ran the Docker image. And once that is once the Docker uh, container is spun up, we just ran the root.sh file. Now let me quickly show you what root.sh file contains. So the root.sh file already got executed. It is simply placing a persist root shell, which is inside this particular directory. Uh, and then it is basically changing its permissions. So now that means we should have that particular file in this because these two are shared directories. If it is here, it should be here. So let's go to cd slash temp slash shared and see what's inside. If you see there is a file there and look at that. It's a it's a it's a SUID British uh, is set and it is currently owned by root. So what that means to us is if this file is executed by a standard user, it is going to run as root because the set UID bit is set on it. So root shell. And look at that we got a root shell now i'm on the same machine but i got a root shell just by spinning up a malicious docker container now let me try to check the contents of etc shadow you can take you can feel free to take screenshots of this uh, shadow file it doesn't help you because it's a virtual machine just, that is just created for this demo okay so that's how we can basically elevate our privileges on uh, machines where we have where we are part of docker group so we have to be careful especially when we are planning to give uh, the privileges of docker to any standard users 
Okay, so that uh, brings us to an end of that demo and I, let's move on. Now, I'll, I'll quickly go back to this slide, uh, which is just before the privilege escalation using volume mounts slide. I skipped it earlier intentionally. Now, let me just come back here. So we are going to see uh, two more different attack techniques. They are going to be used for escaping the container from uh, fr to escape the container to get to get access to the underlying host. So if you noticed all the demos that I have been showing, we are starting a separate container on the host. And once you're on the host, oh, sorry, once you're on the container, you're not you're only on the container, you're not on the host. Unless you share a volume or something like that, you can't do pretty much anything on the on the underlying host. You are pretty much limited uh, uh, to the container itself. Now that's what we want to bypass. Now, if you are inside the container, if you are given access to only uh, to the container, now how how can we basically escape from it to get access to the underlying host? So let's uh, go ahead and check uh, one or two demos on that part. So we are ba basically going to discuss some container breakout techniques. Once again, this is to give you an idea of what not to do uh, or what we have to be aware of when we are what we have to be aware of, especially when we are using Docker as an administrator. So that's the uh, idea of showing this demo. It's not to encourage you to go and hack all the Docker containers on this planet. Right. So let's get started with the first one, which is Docker dot sock. So before this, let me just give you another uh, overview. So we are going to see two demos. One is uh, by mounting, uh, I mean, if a container has this docker.sock mounted, how we can escape from the container and create, uh, get access to the underlying host. That's one thing. And the second one is we are going to see how privileged capabilities can be used to actually write kernel modules onto the Linux kernel that is on the underlying host. So the second demo is going to be very interesting. We are going to, I'm going to demonstrate a kernel module. I'm going to install it into the host's Linux kernel from the container. So that's going to be interesting. So let's, let's uh, move on. So we are basically left with uh, three more concepts and 20 minutes. Let's get started. So the first one, Docker sock. So first, like I did earlier, let me get let me first show you the problem. Docker dot sock is what we have been interacting with. Like when you run Docker commands like Docker pull or whatever, there is a Unix socket that is running on your machine with which the Docker client is interacting. Now, in some cases, if you want to, let's say you want to have a container that can monitor other containers in your setup. So if you want to have such setup, what you have to do is you, you will have to mount the docker.sock that is available on your host onto the container from which you want to do all the monitoring. Now let me just uh, show you how we can create such container. So I'm just uh, starting a new container now. So what it will simply do is it is going to create a new container named sock. I just gave it a name called sock. And if you look at this, it is mounting the var run docker sock file onto the container. Oops, uh, sorry. So so that the container can actually make use of this docker dot sock and it can interact with it, interact with it so that it will also be able to mount. Uh, I mean, it will also be able to monitor other containers that are running on this host. So that's the purpose of this. Now, Let's assume that an attacker has gotten access to this container where this particular file is mounted. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shell on that. I'm going to get a shell on that just to uh, simulate an attacker who got access to it. Now this is what an attacker got. He got, an, he got access to this particular container. Now what he will first do is he will quickly check if that particular file is mounted. So he is going to check where run docker.sock. Interesting, the file is available on this container. That's it, that's all he needs. Now he can basically get out of the container and gain access to the underlying host. So let me quickly show you how he can, how he can do that. So as I mentioned earlier, this particular docker.sock is used to interact with the Unix socket. Uh, 
to be able to monitor other containers in this example. So typically it will have Docker client installed. In case if it is not, we can probably transfer the file from the attacking machine or we can install it. In this case, just to keep it simple, I'm going to install it because it's pretty easy to install the Docker client. So I'm going to install the Docker client as an attacker on the compromised container. Right, now a uh, new Docker client is hopefully installed. Just in a moment. Yep, it does. So it is installed now. Now we have a Docker client. We can quickly check that. So we are inside a container and we have a Docker client available. And as you can see, we are able to list the Docker help command. Now, what I want to do is as an attacker, I want to spin up another container which gives me access to the underlying host. So if you look at this, I am spinning, I'm using the Docker client and I'm specifying that this is the uh, docker.soc file that I want to use as a Unix socket. And I want to mount the host systems root directory and I want to mount it onto the container at slash test. Now what happens is if you hit enter, as you can see at the end, we are also running sh command. So that means after this particular new container is started, we are, automat we are automatically going to get a shell on that container. So if I hit enter, you will get a new prompt that, that is basically the new container. Look at that. This is the new container shell. Now, now let me just show you the slash test folder because if you look at this in the command, we mounted the host machines root directory into slash test. So let's go there and if you type ls, this is basically the host machines uh, file system. So to confirm that we can actually check uh, slash etc is here. So without using etc, like we can simply use etc because we are already there. And look at that. This is basically uh, the hacker user and dev user this is the actual user i am logged in as and pretty much you can even access the shadow file so to summarize what we have done was as an attacker we landed on a container inside which we have this file mounted since this file is mounted on this particular container we managed to spin up a new container because to spin up a new container we need we need access to this and we uh, somehow got access to it because an administrator mounted this onto the container uh, now as an attacker we made use of this particular socket to be able to uh, gain access to the underlying host now we are now we are left with uh, uh, one last demo before we uh, move on to the q and a so the last demo is going to be privileged flag now let's start another container using a different flag so this time same old thing nothing fancy but i'm going to give one extra argument to the container i call it hyphen hyphen privileged so if you see this docker run dash itd and the name and the Alpine, everything is same. Just that we are using a privileged uh, container. Now, typically this is this is pretty common, especially if something is not working because something is broken. And if dash dash privileged is uh, given that something is now started to work. Now in that case, basically we will leave that with, the, with that this dash dash privileged flag because whatever the feature that we wanted to work is working fine. Now, unintentionally what we are actually doing is we are giving it way too many privileges. So for instance, let me just show you the amount of capabilities that this container has uh, in this case. First, let me just uh, get a shell on the newly started container. I got a shell. Now let me just add. I'm just installing a new utility. Uh, so that I can see the amount of uh, capabilities that this particular container has. I'm installing, uh, I, I installed something called CapSH. So if you see this, these are the amount of capabilities that this container has. Now, once again, just to give you a background, if you, are, if you don't know what capabilities are, in Linux, root users are the super users. We all know that. They will have a lot of different capabilities. Now, this is what usually root users get. 
this means these capabilities can be split into different uh, distinct units so for example your root user can also can only be given this many capabilities not everything so the the privileges can be uh, separated into distinct units and those distinct units are called capabilities now by default when we spin up a container with privileged flag it is getting all the capabilities in the world right so that is pretty bad I'll show you why now let's assume that an attacker has gotten a shell on this particular container which is launched as a privileged container now what I'm going to do is I'll spin up now I'm an attacker I'll simply try to make use of one of the capabilities that is dangerous to install a kernel backdoor onto the host machine kernel backdoor is pretty dangerous and let me show you how I'm going to do that I have already created that I'm not going to demonstrate how to compile it and all that uh, I'm, I'm simply going to show you how that can be executed directly so I'm first starting A kernel, I have a kernel module called kernel underscore module dot ko and I'm just starting a simple web server here so that I can download this file onto the uh, compromised container and I'm just going to download that so this is the compromised container we downloaded that now let me just Okay, it is not executable chmod plus x kernel module dot ko okay so now the kernel module is executable now all i have to do is i need to install this kernel module from the container and it is going to be installed on the host machines linux kernel so that's the danger now let me just show you uh, what happens when that is installed now this is the attackers uh, reverse shell listener it is listening on port 4444 and the victim's machine the victim's uh, shell is here now what i'm going to do is ins mod and kernel module dot ko now before hitting enter just uh, uh, take note of this listener here look at that when i hit enter here this particular kernel module is installed on the host machine and I got shell on the host with root privileges because we are getting directly from the kernel so I am currently now uh, the root user on the host machine so that is the danger if privileged flag is used to start a container it is going to give a uh, way too many privileges to the container and, and if an attacker gets access to that he can basically install a, he, he can do pretty much anything that he wants even on the host machine so that's the danger now let me uh, show you the last and final demo before we get into q a this is going to be taking uh, one or two minutes so now we have seen a lot of different attacks now if you're an administrator you probably want to find out uh, what are the best practices that i need to follow in my docker setup now that is where we are going to see this docker bench security tool so this is going to uh, look for uh, the best practices that are defined in uh, cis benchmark for docker so what i'm going to do is i will just simply run this command on my machine where i have installed docker and I am running docker containers so if I run this command what it will do is it is going to uh, it, it is going to uh, do a quick assessment on the host and it is going to tell us if there are any problems with the containers that are started or any any other things so let me quickly do this and show you the output now the docker for docker docker for uh, docker bench for security is running and i'm not going to go through the whole output but I'll, I'll i'll show you one example which is which is already known to you i'll show you that uh, docker bench is able to flag that okay so it's it's not going to take uh, too much of time okay so I already got what I wanted in the output, but let it complete. We are 
Okay, so if you can, if you see this, there are 105 checks and my score is 10. Uh, that seems pretty bad. Now, look at this. There is a warning here. There is a container called priv and the privileges to this container are not restricted. And there is another container called sock. If you remember, these are the last two containers that we have spun up. And it also says that privileges are not restricted to this, this container as well. And so that's that's basically how Docker Bench Security can actually scan the whole uh, setup on your machine and it, it can uh, find out security issues. Now, if you go back and spin up the container without privileged flag, uh, some of those probably will go away. Similarly, we will have to go through all these warnings. And uh, I mean, if, if you're interested, you, you will have to go through all these warnings and then you will have to, you know, uh, fix them. So that brings us to an end and I will open up. I'll be open now for Q&A. Uh, any Levin, can uh, one of you help me? I can't see the chat. How can I see it? Uh, sorry, can, 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 can we have this uh, presentation slide? Yep, I can share it. I'll I'll share. I mean, Condition Zebra will share with everyone. I, okay. I assume. Levin, okay, uh, can you. the slides be shared? Okay, yeah, uh, I think the slides can be shared. Uh, are there any other questions? If yes, please let us know. Uh, which demo are you referring to, Levin? So using a vulnerable image. OK, I'll take this one. Are we trying to go to a Docker host via a vulnerable image? Yeah, it's a misconfigured image. At the, the last demo that I have used is a misconfigured image. The image has, a, a, sorry, misconfigured container. The con When the container is started, it has uh, hyphen hyphen privileged flag used so it has too many uh, it has too many privileges so we we an attacker managed to use that container to get into the docker host the docker host means the underlying uh, operating system which is used for running these containers and uh, how to stop these attackers from our end yeah uh, we, we we will have to do security assessments we will we will we will have to we will have to run all these tools and we will have to make sure that the images that we are running are safe and uh, another another recommendation is that we will have to use a private registry so that uh, only limited people can upload uh, only authorized people can upload and uh, only the whitelisted images will be used in your environment uh, these are some of the things that i can suggest uh, it's it's same. I want. Uh, I I think I did not get this question. Applicable to most of the Docker image in Docker Hub. Actually, we don't know because Docker Hub. You can you can upload an image. I can upload an image, and it may probably have uh, some publicly known vulnerabilities. So another. So we can use a tool called tool called Trivi. T R I V Y that can be used for scanning Docker images. So if there are any known CVs against those images, it can flag it. Uh, uh, somebody is asking for the playback video. Levin, uh, can we provide the playback video? I think are, are they going to get the recording? Levin will respond in the chat. I'll go to the next one. How can we verify the image that we download is clean? Yeah, this I just answered this. We can we need to scan them uh, for known CVs. That's the only thing that I can suggest. Otherwise, we can probably uh, need to we can probably build an image from scratch. That's another way. Because even if there are no CVs, it is possible that the images are backdoored. It's pretty easy to backdoor Docker images, like we, like we backdoor uh, APK files for Android. 
and what is the security best practices to ensure our containers are secure could you provide a couple of advice yeah uh, so i think uh, you can probably go through the cis benchmarks uh, guide that i have the last one the last tool that i have shown you has a checklist like what what needs to be done and what should not be done i think that's a pretty good uh, starting point to get, to start with so if you use cis benchmarks uh, probably that you will get an idea of what uh, how how you can get started uh, through vulnerability assessments will this attack be able to det be detected yes we can detect uh, most of these if we do a vulnerability assessment or a pen test and without using a user that is in the docker group how can we start a container it's not possible i think we we need to use sudo or the user needs to be in uh, docker group so what i was trying to say is uh, I, I mean i gave you jenkins example right so if jenkins uh, is not secured properly properly you are basically giving root access to everything so that is a pretty sensitive instance and we will have to make sure that uh, jenkins has to be secured secure i mean whoever is given access to docker group should be uh, you know uh, only authorized people or authorized systems and they'll have to be properly secured if if they are systems okay so if my misconfigured docker is hosted in aws or azure would any of cloud provider security solutions will prevent a uh, docker attack i i am not sure about it if they i am not sure if they have any thing specific to stop a doc, anything specific to stop docker specific attacks i am not really sure probably i can get back to you later the last demo is using the audit tool what are the audit tool that is uh, docker bench security i'll i can show my screen it's docker bench security it's a free tool free and open source you can find the github link here and i'll probably put it in the chat as well uh, any specialized docker container training provided by condition zebra uh, I think is that Wilson? Okay, so any provide any specialized Docker security training provided by Condition Zebra? I think uh, they do. You can probably reach out to. Uh, you can take a note of this and probably write an email, or uh, or probably uh, the marketing team can get back to you. Levin. Uh, I guess uh, one of you probably can uh, reach out to this person. And uh, SQL injection can be used in Docker Docker Bench security. Uh, I'm not sure if I get this question. I think I didn't understand this. Mm, yep. So if you want to re retype the question, probably I can answer it. Otherwise, uh, I didn't understand this. SQL injection can use in Docker Bench security. All right, so if there are no other questions, we can. What is the name of the tool to do the vulnerability assessment? The one I suggest to do, the one I used in the demo is this Docker Bench Security. You can, this is the open source tool, but there are many other tools that can be used. Like, like I said, we need to scan the images. We need to, uh, there, we need to also harden the containers using app armor profiles, seccom profiles and stuff like that. Does this contain CIS benchmark? Yes, this is built based on CIS benchmarks. Uh, can we have the Docker containers text file? Yes, I will share the. I'll share all the demos. Uh, I mean, all the commands that I have used in today's demo. I'll share that. Is there any tool that can automatically hardening the Docker? Uh, I think 
i i don't think there is anything that can automatically harden there is always uh, a need for doing it manually because it may break your systems like if you run something that automatically fixes something without your knowledge it may probably break the system so uh, i mean uh, it's it's possible to do it but uh, it's not suggested to do it we, we should always uh, uh, do a manual review of what we are doing all right so if there are no other questions i think we can wrap up uh, levin or any anyone else from the condition zebra team uh, want to take over okay thank you shri hello can you hear me yes yes i can hear you okay thank you shri for your uh, sharing knowledge Okay, thank you everyone for attending our webinar. Uh, for the recorded session, I will share with you guys tomorrow. So, have a good day ahead. Bye, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, bye.